Starship goes on a roll, a new human spaceflight record has been broken, and SpaceX keeps up the pace. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 9th of February, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. This week we had a human spaceflight record that hadn't been broken in nine years. Cosmonaut Oleg Kononenko has become the person with the most time spent in space, surpassing cosmonaut Gennady Padalka, who held this record since 2015. That record had stood at just over 878 days accumulated over Padalka's five flights into orbit. Kononenko is currently on the ISS as commander of Expedition 70, and he's also commander of the spacecraft that he flew up on, which is Soyuz MS-24. However, as of now, the plan is not for him to go back to Earth on the same spacecraft, but rather on the Soyuz MS-25 spacecraft in September. This is because Russia wants to fly a cosmonaut from Belarus up on that mission as part of a recent agreement between the two countries. This Belarusian cosmonaut, Marina Vasilevskaya, would only stay for a short visit, so in that case she'd fly up on MS-25 and then return on MS-24 about a week later. So all of this means that Kononenko's impressive record of cumulative time in space will go for a lot longer than just over 878 days. All things considered, he could log up to 1,100 days in space by the time he returns back on Soyuz MS-25. Now for some of you, Kononenko's name may sound familiar. He was the cosmonaut that commanded the Soyuz MS-11 mission back in 2018, and he participated in the EVA that was used to inspect the orbital module of the Soyuz MS-09 spacecraft. This vehicle had a small hole on its orbital module that was then sealed, but in order to investigate this in depth, he had to go out and cut through the many layers of insulation and protection with a knife to get to the location of the leak. So you can't say he hasn't seen quite a bit of action during his time in space. Like all records, this amount of time in space is obviously unprecedented, but it's good to remember that this is total time in space, and not time spent in space in just one single mission. That record goes to Valery Polyakov, who stayed on the Mir station for 437 days between 1994 and 1995, setting a record that has yet to be broken. But with deep space missions soon to become more common, and with a shiny rocket promising to take humans to Mars, well who knows? Maybe this record won't hold for too much longer. And now let's take a look at this week in launches. Starting off the week on February 2nd, we had the launch of a Changzheng 2C at 2337 UTC from Launch Complex 3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. The rocket was carrying a batch of 11 GSAT satellites into low Earth orbit. The GSAT satellites are part of a satellite constellation being developed by G-Space, a subsidiary of Chinese car company Geely. These satellites are being used for accurate positioning on, you guessed it, cars, but they can also be used for marine or aerial applications. The satellites also sport other payloads capable of providing cloud data and ocean state observation. This was the second launch of operational GSAT satellites, with 20 out of about 70 satellites that the company hopes to launch now successfully in orbit. After that, we had the launch of a Zhelong 3 on February 3rd at 3.06 UTC from the Boron Jiazhou launch platform located off the coast of China. This was the third launch of the Zhelong 3 rocket overall, and it was carrying nine satellites into a sun-synchronous orbit. Some of these satellites included remote sensing satellites like the Yantai-2 spacecraft or the Xing Shidai 18, 19, and 20 satellites. There was also an experimental technology satellite from Egypt, Nexat-1, which aims to drive the development of satellite components from Egypt. Another of these payloads was also a potential experimental satellite called DRO-L. Its purpose is not yet clear, but it sounds like it may be the first of a three-satellite experimental constellation of lunar navigation satellites. While this one would be in an Earth orbit, the other two would launch next month along with the Chiachao 2 relay satellite. While navigation on the Moon is good enough as it is, having more precise positional data of objects around and on the Moon could be helpful for setting up bases there in the future. And keeping up the pace, we had the launch of a Falcon 9 rocket carrying NASA's PACE spacecraft. See what I did there? Liftoff took place on February 8th at 6.33 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. Falcon 9 took a 10-minute uphill ride into orbit, placing PACE directly into its roughly 680km sun-synchronous orbit. In order to do this, the rocket had to perform a massive dogleg around the southern portions of Florida to avoid dropping rocket hardware over populated areas in case of an accident. 
Now this doesn't mean that the rocket can't directly fly over these populated areas. On the one hand, because the rocket is going really fast, its impact point is not directly underneath it, but rather some few hundred kilometers further down in its trajectory into orbit. So you could overfly the southern parts of Florida while the drop zone of this hardware may be very well offshore. But on the other hand, there's also a point in time where even if the impact point is over a populated area like, say, Cuba, the speed of the debris during re-entry would likely burn up a lot of it, and the bits that survive would have a really small chance of hitting anyone on the ground. But this is not Falcon 9's first rodeo doing this. It was actually the 12th time that it's done this. Falcon 9 first performed this maneuver all the way back in 2020 with the SAOCOM 1B mission that also went into a sun-synchronous orbit. This capability is enabled by Falcon 9's Autonomous Flight Termination System, or AFTS, that allows it to autonomously terminate the flight without the need of ground tracking assets. This type of trajectory allows SpaceX to fly polar missions from Florida in addition to the ones that the company already flies from Vandenberg. For this mission, SpaceX's bid had the possibility to launch PACE either from Vandenberg or Florida, and the company consulted with the science team on where it would be best to launch from. The answer? Well, the science team preferred Florida as it was closer to Goddard Space Flight Center, which is where it's based out of. Now this whole trajectory ordeal is needed to put PACE into a sun-synchronous orbit, which allows it to observe the Earth on every orbit with the same illumination conditions. PACE, which stands for Plankton Aerosol Cloud Ocean Ecosystem, is set to precisely observe all of that in order to better understand the Earth. PACE will be able to capture in unprecedented detail lots of data about the changes in ocean conditions, the aerosols in our atmosphere, and the interactions between the air and the ocean that may impact our ecosystems of the planet. Prior to its launch, we were able to interview Dr. Jeremy Wordell, project scientist for PACE, who can tell you much better just how much more data the mission will be able to capture. How much information you expect to collect and manage? This is going to be one of the very interesting parts of the discovery aspect of this mission. Uh, just from the ocean color instrument alone, we're moving from this box of eight crowns to 200. And that's just a ton of new rainbow spectral information. And then you have our two multi-angle polarimeters that not only measure colors of light, but they measure different polarization states. So imagine having polarized glasses on. And then they measure at multiple view angles ranging from 5 to 60. So there are thousands and thousands of unique pieces of information for every pixel on Earth we're going to collect. It's going to be a lot. And the innovation has really begun in terms of, well, how do you start using machine learning and other computer data science tools in those toolboxes to manage all of this information? So when I say we're going to have so much to grow into, which I say all of the time, there's so much. I'm not even sure, uh, I'm too old for this, <laughs> to be honest. I'm not sure I'm gonna deal with it. The mission was originally scheduled to launch on February 6th, but it was delayed two days because of weather. Kind of ironic that the launch of a satellite set to study the atmosphere and the ocean gets delayed because of said atmosphere and ocean. The Falcon 9 booster for this mission, B-1081, was flying for a fourth time, and it successfully returned back to Earth, landing back on land at SpaceX's landing zone one. And from launches into orbit, let's now go to a return from orbit. The Axiom 3 mission came to a close this week with the return of Crew Dragon Freedom and its crew of four. The mission had lifted off on January 18th, and it was supposed to stay on the ISS until the 1st or 2nd of February, but bad weather in Florida postponed its return. Now, I'm sure no one in the crew complained about having to stay for an extra week in space due to this. One interesting thing from this mission, though, is that Axiom 3 Commander Michael Lopez Alegria seems to go hand in hand with weather delays when it comes to returning missions back to Earth. Of his six missions into space, five of them have suffered extensions to their stay in orbit due to bad weather on the ground. He flew on STS-92, which was extended two days due to high winds at KSC and then eventually landed at Edwards instead. He also flew on STS-113, which was again extended by three days due to bad weather. This even happened on his only Soyuz mission, Soyuz TMA-9, which was also delayed due to bad weather at its landing location in Kazakhstan. His previous mission, Axiom-1, also suffered a one-week extension due to weather off the coast of Florida. So I'm pretty sure if you definitely want to be up in space for longer than you plan to, Michael is the only person to fly with. They get excited when he's on Earth. He spends more time, he spends more time in space than he does on Earth. He gets a patch. 
when he's on Earth. Weather delays aside, the mission went well and the crew got to see the arrival of the NG-20 Cygnus spacecraft to the ISS. It's not every day that you go to the ISS for a short stay and get to see another spacecraft arrive. Freedom undocked from the ISS Harmony module on February 7th at 1420 UTC after staying on the station for 18 days. After roughly two days orbiting Earth, Dragon splashed down off the coast of Daytona in Florida on February 9th at around 1330 UTC. With this flight, the three rookies on board, Walter Viaday, Alper Gazaravja, and Marcus Vaughn, have now logged 21 days, 16 hours, and 41 minutes in space. This time now also gets added to Michael Lopez Alegria's long space flight career for a new total of 275 days in space. SpaceX is gearing up for even more Starship testing ahead of the rocket's third flight. This week, the company rolled out Booster 10 to the launch site, and Ship 28 may come soon afterward. This is for what we expect to be testing in its fully stacked configuration. This testing may involve anything from partial propellant load testing all the way up to a full wet dress rehearsal. This comes after over a month of work on these vehicles at the Starbase production site, which included the removal of Booster 10's hot staging ring for a few weeks and removal and even potential replacement of engines on Ship 28. Additionally, a lot of launch pad systems have been upgraded and worked on over the last few months since the last flight of Starship. It's precisely due to all of this that it's not a surprise to see these two vehicles being prepared for full stack testing. There's a lot of stuff that will need to be rehearsed ahead of flight. This will likely even include a new countdown and propellant load sequence, so all the more reason to perform a wet dress rehearsal. This stack testing could happen as early as this Monday, as road closures have been posted for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Central. All of this comes right as NASA, under multiple Freedom of Information Act requests, has released footage of the second Starship flight taken from the agency's WB-57 aircraft and other points of view. The footage skips the hot staging event and the termination of the booster, but according to NASA, this is because it's deemed to contain proprietary information, which means SpaceX prefers to not make this public to protect their tech. At least we were able to capture it from the ground. But coming back to this upcoming stack testing, it's unknown whether Ship 28 will need some sort of extra static fire testing afterward. Since its engines were replaced, it's possible that it could need that extra testing, but we just don't know. Of course, you all know us, we'll be keeping an eye on it, as always. And now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Was that an earthquake? No, it was Blue Origin igniting its BE-4 engines at its Huntsville test stand for the first time. The blue flames of the BE-4 engine were test fired at Rocket City's test stand 4670 on February 1st after years of upgrades. The site has been active for six months, with multiple firings of New Glenn's BE-3U upper stage engines taking over the area for minutes at a time. In fact, we featured that on a previous episode when it happened. The test stand, which was originally designed in 1961, was built to test Saturn V's F1 engines. Now, after five years of upgrades, Blue has prepared it for testing the engines that will someday take New Glenn to orbit. This test was the first time a BE-4 had been fired on the East Coast, barring the launch of Vulcan a month ago. This is Blue Origin's second test stand supporting BE-4, with the other one residing at the company's other test facility in West Texas. With this new test site, it may only be a matter of time until we see Vulcan and New Glenn flying on the BE-4s tested here. This week, ULA CEO Tori Bruno teased us with the progress of Vulcan's second flight-worthy vehicle by posting a picture of a BE-4 engine arriving at the company's factory in Decatur, Alabama. In the photo, we can see part of BE-4's complicated plumbing and the outside of the engine bell. There's not much else to look at, except if we look at the background of the photo, we can also see a Vulcan booster being worked on, and it may very well be the one that receives this engine. Even further back, we can see what appears to be an Atlas V booster as well, which illustrates quite the difference in diameter from one booster to the other. It doesn't look like the Vulcan booster has any liveries on it, but this could be added at a later time, depending on the mission. This specific BE-4 was manufactured in Huntsville at Blue Origin's engine factory, which started production nearly four years ago. If all goes well, this engine, along with another one, should help to propel Sierra Space's Dream Chaser space plane to the International Space Station later this year. NASA's Juno has gotten closer to the most active volcanic body in the solar system once again. The spacecraft has been on a mission to study Jupiter and its moons since its arrival at the Jovian system in 2016, performing multiple orbits around the giant planet over the years. 
During its latest closest approach to Jupiter, it also performed a close flyby of Io at only 1,500 kilometers away from the surface of Jupiter's third largest and closest moon. The gravitational pull of Jupiter and its other large moons causes tidal forces to heat up Io's interior, which has caused it to stay extremely geologically active. One of the reasons why Juno's mission was extended in 2021 was precisely to examine this volcanic activity in detail, which it was able to observe during this latest flyby as evidenced by the active plumes and lava lakes seen on the surface. This is the last flyby Juno is expected to make of Io, but the spacecraft is still orbiting Jupiter and still gathering data about the planet and the environment around it, which will prove crucial for the JUICE and Europa Clipper missions arriving later this decade. Ingenuity's final resting place has been captured by Perseverance after its accident on January 18th. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory released this mosaic from Perseverance's camera showing the small helicopter. This mosaic was made out of six different images captured from a distance of 450 meters, so Ingenuity appears as a little helicopter standing in the sand dunes of Mars. In this mosaic, we can sort of make out the broken rotors from its accident, although because it's a distant shot, it is a bit hard to see. As of right now, we still don't know exactly what happened, other than that there was a blackout of communications before touchdown and the rotors were damaged upon landing. This is somewhat sad, as it may very well be one of the final images of Ingenuity that we see from the surface of Mars. Perseverance will continue its own exploration of the Red Planet, moving further and further away until eventually it won't be able to see Ingenuity anymore. But at least we get to have a few last looks at it while we still can. Chinese private launcher Landspace is preparing for a 10-kilometer vertical takeoff and vertical landing flight test of a hopper version of its Zuk-3 rocket. This comes after the recent test of another hopper on January 13th of this year that successfully hopped to 350 meters and landed back only tens of meters away from the launch site. This upcoming test will see the hopper flying up to 10 kilometers under the power of one or maybe more TQ-12 engines. These will then shut down and the booster will attempt to land softly on a landing pad on the ground. Landspace aims for this flight to 10 kilometers to occur in June ahead of full production of the Zuk-3 rocket in 2025, with its debut launch happening shortly after. Now, a 10 kilometer flight test. Where have I heard that before? And now, let's see what to look forward to next week in spaceflight. Starting off next week, we'll have the launch of yet another lunar lander. A Falcon 9 rocket is set to launch the Intuitive Machines Mission 1 with the Nova C lunar lander. The lander is already at the pad where it's undergone a fueling test. This lander will be fed cryogenic liquid oxygen and liquid methane propellants during the countdown through the Falcon 9 transporter erector, so this testing was required to check out the systems ahead of launch. That launch is set to occur from Launch Complex 39A in Florida on February 14th at 5.57 UTC. Less than 24 hours after that, another Falcon 9 is set to launch from Space Launch Complex 40 carrying the USS F-124 mission. This mission will also make use of the Southern Polar Corridor and the dogleg capabilities of Falcon 9 around the south of Florida. Another interesting thing from this mission is that both the launch of Nova C and this mission are set to have their boosters returning back to land and will occur very close in time. This means that SpaceX will most likely land one of these boosters at landing zone 2 and land the other booster at landing zone 1, as the company previously did in December of 2022. Ironically, this instance also occurred between the launch of a lunar lander and a mission taking the southern polar corridor at the Cape 2. Right after that, from Japan, we'll have the second flight of the H-3 rocket, which is attempting to reach orbit after its failed debut last year. The 3-hour, 44-minute launch window is set to open on February 15th at 22 minutes past midnight UTC. And during that window, we'll also have the launch of a Soyuz 2.1A rocket with the Progress MS-26 spacecraft headed to the International Space Station. Liftoff is set to occur on February 15th at 3.25 UTC, with docking to the aft end of the Zvezda module planned to occur two days later on February 17th at 6.12 UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news! We'll see you all again next week to recap this week in spaceflight.